Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg UK. A special focus on the biggest challenges facing the British government, economy, financial services and markets. I'm Kriti Gupta right here in London. We start with King Charles has set out an election focused government agenda at the ceremonial opening of the UK Parliament this week. In the King's speech, which is written by the government, of course, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak focused on a series of low cost policies ahead of an election expected next year. My minister's focus is on increasing economic growth and safeguarding the health and security of the British people for generations to come. My government will continue to take action to bring down inflation, to ease the cost of living for families and help businesses fund new jobs and investments. Now, one of the key issues ahead of that next general election is the state of the U.K. economy, as we just laid out. According to Bloomberg Economics, the U.K. likely already in that recession that a lot of the markets are warning about. Joining me now, Bloomberg's Dan Hansen of Bloomberg Economics and Joe Mays, who covers U.K. politics for us as well. Pleasure to have you both on set. Uh, Dan, I'm going to start here with you. Yeah. We're talking about a recession already in the works. This is something that a lot of people were saying would happen one, two years ago or maybe two years out. Why is a recession happening now? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good point, isn't it? Because a year ago we were having the same discussion, but it was for very different reasons. It was about an energy crisis, and that was what we thought would tip the economy into recession. We've actually had a year of, relative to that forecast, some good news. Yes, it's been stagnation, but it's much better than a big fall in GDP. The reason now why we think the economy is headed for a recession is because of what the Bank of England's done. Essentially, because the energy shock hasn't had as big effect on the economy, slowed the economy and slowed inflation, the Bank of England's had to do a lot more than it expected, uh, certainly than it expected at the start of the year. And that's why we have a fall in GDP in our forecast. I mean, just one, one really important point around this that I'll just finish on is that the peak to trough fall in our forecast is very modest relative to historical um, episodes. So it is a fall in GDP, but it's not wildly different from what the Bank of England said last week. They had stagnation all the way out to the middle of 2025. So the difference between those two forecasts isn't huge. So the conversation, the pivot there between inflation to stagnation at, at its core. Joe, I hop in, into this conversation here because no one's saying stagnation in the political rhetoric. It is still all about inflation. What is the talk at Westminster? Yeah, I think the talk is, was this King's speech enough for Rishi Sunak to kind of win back the attention of the public, get some momentum into his administration? And the feeling is that it probably didn't necessarily do that. I mean, Sunak is constrained by the difficult economic circumstances we've just talked about. So he's having to do things which are low cost, as you mentioned, such as focusing on crime, you know, such as focusing on perhaps culture war style issues, which might get them a boost in the polls. But it doesn't seem to be translating at the moment. So there's some skepticism in Westminster whether you know, Rishi Sunak can turn it around. Still 20 points behind Labour in the polls. I mean, it's a really tough uh, idea because not only is Rishi Sunak dealing with this, but a lot of world leaders are as well. And I think the way that the UK has really changed what is actually on their agenda is, is pretty interesting. Do they then set the, the, the tone for other world leaders as well? I want to bring you some sound, if I can, from what Andrew Bailey actually said about this very issue. Take a listen. It can sometimes be challenging. Uh, as we've seen in recent years, when the economy is exposed to very big external shocks. And we've been experiencing and sadly continue to do see some very big ones of late. We have to recognize that today we live in a world economy which is experiencing fragmentation. And that is at risk of further such pressure. Now, we know Andrew Bailey there speaking about this risk of fragmentation. It's something that is almost unique to the way the U.K. economy is structured. When you look at the housing market, when you look at the mortgage market, for example, a very different set of tools that uh, the BOE has to actually tackle this. So you can't actually see them necessarily taking the cue from the Federal Reserve or from the ECB. Dan, your take on fragmentation. So I think the point, the, the point I take away and the broad point I think that Bailey's trying to make is we live now in a world where... Prior to the financial crisis, it was all about demand shocks, and it was very easy for interest rates to control that, because interest rates control the demand side of the economy. This idea of fragmentation, it goes to the idea of supply shocks. We've had the financial crisis, we've had Brexit here in the UK, we've obviously had the pandemic, and we've now had the energy crisis as well, and they're all what we call supply shocks. And what that creates, for a central bank at least, and particularly when there's a lot of pressure on the central bank to be the first port of call when it comes to supporting the economy, it creates a trade-off. So inflation goes up, 
but growth weakens, the economy, the economy falters. And so the question for the central bank and for policymakers generally is how do you balance that? Because, of course, if you try and stimulate the economy, try and support the economy, you lift inflation. And the, the lesson we've had of the past maybe 18 months is that inflation expectations haven't been well anchored. So it's quite possible that policymakers have to focus a lot more on that inflation side of their mandate and the economy suffers as a result. Joe, weigh in on that here, because uh, Rishi Sunak famously says when it comes to the tax question that inflation is a tax. How are they changing, changing their agenda to address the supply side shocks that Dan was just talking about? Well, I think the balancing act that Dan talks about, there's a political balancing act which is very similar, which is that you want to curb inflation. That's Rishi Sunak's priority. But doing that means that you cannot necessarily do the politically popular things you might want to do on spending, such as, you know, increasing welfare, perhaps, or um, tax cuts, as, as you mentioned. You can't do both those things. So Rishi Sunak and the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, have to straddle those two, that, that divide, that dilemma. And we'll see the autumn statement coming up, November 22nd. Will they now lean perhaps more towards the tax cuts because they see that election coming up? They need to do something about the polls, you know, their backs are increasingly against the wall here, and it's a question of which way will they go? Will they get a bit politically desperate? We'll have to wait and see. Well, speaking of politically desperate, um, not that that is my take on the situation, but when you talk about, again, with the agenda changing and addressing the inflation, Dan mentioned the energy crisis specifically, let's talk a little bit about the green agenda here. I think it was ironic that King Charles has been such an advocate of the environment, and yet when you looked at what the King's speech actually laid out, some of it was kind of... Uh, momentum behind Rishi Sunak's U-turn on, say, EVs, for example. Yeah, that was a potentially awkward moment for the monarch because he has that history of being very pro-environment pro but then having to announce future licensing rounds for oil and gas drilling, you know, not necessarily thing he would want to support. But the government's argument is that they're still going to get to that net zero goal, but they're just doing it in a more pragmatic, more measured way. But yeah, it certainly wasn't uh, perhaps King Charles' favourite moment uh, as monarch. I mean, talk to us then a little bit about the economics of all of that as well. Um, not necessarily of the monarchy, we'll put that to the side. But let's talk a little bit about the, the move on the energy side as well. Because I think yep. one of the unique pieces of Europe and, and the UK is that there is an economic incentive here to actually talk about EVs because of the energy crisis. But in the absence of that, in the absence of this pressure from heating bills, um, from the cost of living, which to be fair is easing, do you still see that same momentum going into alternatives to the energy story? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's a really good question. Actually, what Labour had to do and Labour have done is obviously scale back their ambition on their green agenda. And a lot of this goes back to what Joe mentioned before. It, it, it's the fiscal story. There is such a constraint around the fiscal numbers and the fiscal outlook that actually using, using any, any fiscal space they have, we know, at least for the Conservative Party, in the run-up to the coming election, is about tax cuts. And any space they have, they'll use that. So the green, the green agenda is being pushed back. I think, ultimately, there will be a reckoning where this, this has to happen. But, of course, the longer you leave it, the bigger the adjustment that comes to the economy. And it goes back to that point about supply shocks. You know, this is, this is another supply shock that's on the horizon. And so you, you get to this point where... As I say, you have this reckoning where you have to, you have to make this adjustment. And I think it, it has to come, it will come. But the fiscal reality at the moment means that the, the path of least resistance is to delay. What's the breaking point then? I mean, to see this massive pivot from Andrew Bailey when it comes to the rate story, we were talking about this hawkish rhetoric that just would not die down. And suddenly, we're not talking about rate cuts on the agenda for 2024. What changed? Yeah, I mean, it was a big pivot, wasn't it? In yeah. September, it was a real... It was a real surprise to us, given where things like wage growth, services, inflation have been, or are, I should say. And they're the things that have been driving the bank for the past 18 months. That's what's really been driving this rate hiking cycle. And to be honest, what changed? I think it came down to the fact that the labour market looked like it's, or looks like it's loosening faster than the bank expected. The economy, as we spoke about at the start, is weakening faster than they expected. And it's really interesting, in that September decision, Bailey had the casting vote. And he went on the side of, of keeping rates on hold. And I think that that's an interesting story about how that will play out next year. If we get tax cuts, that's obviously inflationary. And then that, going to your point about rate cuts, it's like, what is the timing for that? So we're in recession, potentially in recession. We've still got sticky inflation. So that balancing act is going to be very, very difficult for the Bank of England. And on the outside of it all, at the same time, will be the political pressure for the economy to be stimulated, the economy to be in a good place going into the election. 
Well, Joe's going to have plenty to talk about and plenty to cover uh, for Bloomberg. Dan Hansen from Bloomberg Economics and Joe Mays from our political team, we thank you both for diving into that. Plenty more to come ahead, including our interview with UK City Minister Andrew Griffith coming up next. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. the role of London, and this is true on crypto assets, distributed ledger technology, but it's also true, I think, on uh, AI and other emerging domains, is you know, there's, we, sh we should try and see ourselves as a little bit of a Goldilocks, a bit of an honest broker. So, you know, not at the always the, the bleeding edge. There'll be other regimes that, you know, are more dynamic, but don't have some of the quality and trust attributes of London. Uh, but neither should we put our head in the sand when there's innovation happening. You know, London is a fintech hub um, and there are opportunities from technologies as well as clearly risks. And, and we've probably seen, you know, quite a lot of the risk side of the ledger quite publicly. Um, so we want to steer a middle course. We've been, I think, very thoughtful. We've consulted a lot. Um, we came out last week with, you know, a set of principles for the regulation of crypto assets in the UK. Mm -hmm. Again, in part building on what others have done. Europe have, have come out with their own version. Uh, we've built on that, taken a little bit further forward in some areas like DeFi. Mm -hmm. um, and not leave it as a regulatory vacuum. So, so we, we are now bringing the financial promotion of crypto assets within the perimeter of the regulator. You know, that, that, that will, you know, it'll cause a little bit of noise, but it will also incentivize the good actors that, that want to invest in the right systems, that are willing to be transparent, have the right protective mechanisms in place. It will give them an incentive that they can build a sustainable business on the back of that. But so do you see crypto as being a kind of increasingly important part of kind of London's portfolio of of, uh, of things that it's, uh, you know... I'd hope so. I think it's an, like, ultimately the market will decide yeah. um, or investors will decide. Um, I think it builds naturally on our strengths in terms of things like fintech, in payments, technologies, in clearance, how, in clearance. Uh, and we've got a big piece of work on digitalization of share registers of securitizations. <laughs> UK City Minister Andrew Griffith there speaking to Bloomberg's David Merritt on crypto and its place in London's financial ecosystem. You can, of course, listen to that full interview on Bloomberg's In the City podcast that Francine Lacqua hosts with David Merritt. You can find on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever it is you get your podcast. New episodes do drop every Thursday. I want to bring in a true expert about some of the cross currents you're seeing on the economic and the political front. Lizzie Galbraith, political economist over at Aberdeen, joins the program. Lizzie a pleasure to have you on. Let's start with the King speech here. There isn't, it's not a secret that there is really very little fiscal headroom when it comes to the budget and what promises both Andrew Bailey and Rishi Sunak can actually make. In terms of cost cutting, what can they do? There has been a process over the last 10 years where we've seen quite a significant amount of government spending come down. But then you had COVID and you've actually seen a lot of that reverse. The size of the civil service has gone back up again. You've had additional strain on the NHS, which has put um, more pressure on um, public services as well. So it's not particularly clear where the government can implement a very substantial cost-cutting measure at this point. We are expecting that the government is going to look at some ways to bring down um, this um, spending on benefits. Um, so there will be some tweaks around um, perhaps eligibility criteria or the helping people get back into work. So you're spending less on benefits. But really, the government does have a pretty tricky job ahead of itself in trying to get government spending to come back down um, going forward. Well, in terms of bringing it back down, then, it, it's, it's also partnered, or I should say paired, with this domestic pressure for tax cuts. And I'm curious about what odds you think are there are of, of tax cuts going into 2024. I think the most likely um, time we're going to see tax cuts is going to be in the spring budget rather than this coming autumn statement. And yes, there might be slightly more fiscal headroom than the government had initially expected at this autumn statement, but it's still not going to be very much. And actually, from a political perspective, you do want to have voters actually have tax cuts in the front of their minds as you're going into an election campaign. So politically and potentially fiscally, it may make more sense to wait until the spring 
growing, even if there is slightly more fiscal headroom than the government has been anticipating at this autumn statement. I think there will be a lot of political pressure on the government to act now, but Sunak is likely to want to hold off until the spring, um, partly because there may well even be more fiscal headroom um, at that point, and they may well be able to get a more um, compelling um, suite of tax cuts um, announced at that um, statement rather than um, some fairly small measures now. Well, speaking of, I guess, compelling arguments to be made, it felt like one of the real sticking points for, for Labour and something that has perhaps given them a little bit more of the edge has been how they've been approaching the business community specifically. It feels like there has been a real exodus almost from the UK because of the concerns around the cost of living crisis, because of the concerns around uh, the fiscal budget as well. Lizzie, talk to us a little bit about the business community and how they might be viewing what Rishi Sunak has to offer. I think the issue that Sunak has at the moment, that he's been trying to sell himself as the change candidate, the responsible partner of, of businesses post Liz Truss. And the issue is that Actually, what we've been seeing is we've been seeing a lot of uh, U-turns in government policy around things like green infrastructure. Um, that has um, lowered business confidence in, um, in this government. And you've not really seen any compelling evidence coming from the government that they are the, the candidates of change, that they are um, crafting um, a solution to the economic problems that the UK is um, facing. Now, Labour whether or not um, their solution is the right one or not, have got more of an answer to that question. They have, they have um, been more focused on generating um, an argument for what they want to do with the economy going forward. And we've not really seen the government able to back up this, um, this change message that, that they've been trying to sell. And I think that disconnect is the thing that's really undermining um, the, the government at this point. But Lizzie, you mentioned the green reform kind of U-turn that they had made very quickly. Could that actually play in, the favor, in their favor going into 2024, given that, in theory at least, that should be a more economically friendly policy towards the, the, the British public? We've not actually seen the polls move too much since um, Sunak started announcing these um, these uh, policy changes. So there isn't a much evidence to, to suggest that voters are responding very positively to, to these announcements. Yes, it's working in some specific areas. You saw in, um, in some recent by-elections that it's likely to have had a result um, because of voter backlash against um, low traffic zones. But as a country, it doesn't look like it's really moving the needle for Sunak. Um, it doesn't look like this is maybe the, the single issue that's going to spark a turnaround in his political fortunes at this point. Certainly something we're going to be keeping a very close eye on. Lizzie Galbraith, political economist at Aberdeen, we thank you so much for your analysis this morning and joining the program. Coming up, the latest survey from estate agents and surveyors suggests that the UK housing market may have bottomed out in October. We're going to drill down into the country's property market next. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. London's rental costs are showing signs of easing with demand dropping and evidence that people are refusing to pay record costs just to secure a home. Now, according to research from property surveyors, tenant demand across the UK recorded the slowest quarter on quarter increase in October since 2021. More broadly, the survey from Rick says house prices will remain under pressure. It's a lot to digest, but not for Bloomer economist Neeraj Shah joining us now right here on set. Neeraj, a little bit of a mixed picture when it comes to what you're seeing in the housing market here. What is actually happening? What is your take? So maybe the best way to look at it is there's less bad news across the board. With the rental side, there's less pressures coming forward. In London, there's a real pushback, actually, and that's really down to affordability. I think ten tenants have reached their limit. And um, going forward, some are moving out of London. Some are actually enticed into buying property because they're paying so much rent. You have to remember, rents in London have increased by about 30% since the pandemic. So that's extraordinary. On the other side, house prices themselves, they are still, the, the survey shows they're still going to be negative but less negative ahead. But remember, at minus 63, that's still a significantly low level. That's sort of 
emulates level in 2009, so it's still quite significant. So That's quite the comparison. Yeah. So less bad news, you say, but does that mean the worst is behind us? Is this a recovery in the making? It might be the best way to look at it is that we've passed the peak crunch, but a slow puncture is still yet to continue. And what, essentially, the bottom line is mortgage rates are still elevated, and that's going to put pressure on house prices ahead. Uh, you've had Nationwide, you've had Halifax, all showing a bounce back recently, but I'd, be, I'd throw a bit of caution into that. The transactions are very low at the moment, which can distort figures, but also there's a fundamental lack of supply, and there might be a bit more supply coming through next year. Would you characterize that bounce back as resiliency, though? There is definitely some resilience. Um, this is partly because of the labour market. For prices to fall dramatically, you need forced sales, and that usually happens when unemployment rises quite sharply. We are seeing unemployment creeping up, but they're still from historic low levels, and that's keeping people on, not from for selling their homes. All right, I'm going to put you on the spot here. We've seen a real pivot point from Andrew Bailey. Now you're having rate cuts priced into the market as well. Could this all change? You mentioned resiliency. Is there some delicacy to it as well? 20 seconds if you can. Yes, there's very much delicacy. But, um, one thing, it's, a, it's all about inflation still. So we don't expect rate cuts to happen until end of next year. So mortgage rates are going to be elevated for some time yet. Not something that a lot of future property owners may want to hear. Bloomberg European economist Neeraj Shah joining us to break it all down. We thank you so much. I want to give you another reminder to subscribe to our podcast in the city. David Merritt, Francine Lockwell walking you through the key issues to know. You can, of course, find that on your Apple podcast, Spotify or anywhere else you are listening in on audio. Great interviews, coverage you do not want to miss. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg.